here we are. Here we are, here we are, here we are. I sure hope that you are able to hear me okay. I am um, in a new place doing this live and the internet's not great. So when you hop on here, um, would you just let me know if you're hearing me okay, if it's coming across okay, if <laughs> uh, just let me know what you can hear and what you can't hear. Um, I saw like a sad little emoji or whatever when people, I don't know what that means. Um, hey Vicki, good to see you on here. How am I sounding? Am I lagging at all or am I okay? If you are just getting on here, would you do me a favor? And, oh good, hi Vicki, hi Victoria, um, good, good. Um, if you get on here, would you share this immediately because a lot of people are having a hard time finding this and you should just share goodness. I think share goodness whenever you find it. So as soon as you get on, share it and it will go to all of your people. And it's your small way of bringing hope into the midst of chaos, in the midst of their busy scrolling. Um, I have a feeling that they are going to experience goodness uh, in the midst of all of the crazy. Uh, good evening, friends. Honestly, I, <laughs> I was so eager to come on here. Like I have had to fight coming on and going live during the week because I was like, well, I don't want them to think that's it, even though probably I could have just done it. But I was so eager to come on because I miss you all. I miss um, the reality of sitting with people and to preach and to teach and to hold space with all of you. And so thank you. It is not lost on me that you could be doing a thousand other things. Um, well, maybe not a thousand. <laughs> in this day and age, maybe like five other things. Um, but you chose to come on here. And I believe that there is goodness for you. And I believe that there is hope for you. Um, and so I'm so excited you're here. And I am so excited to spend the next hour or a little less uh, with you. Um, okay, good. Uh, so many of you are saying it's good. I just want to say hi to Liz and or Melinda. Good to see you on here. Um, if you're just getting on, if you would do me a favor, and just share this right now in real time. It's gonna be shared on Freedom Movement's page, um, Haley San. Um, so if you would be so kind as to share it, I believe it's gonna be goodness for those that are going to, to come across it. Um, again, I have got my all my written out notes. It's really professional <laughs> uh, for you tonight. And I just really enjoyed um, yeah, like thinking through this. Now, I want to have a disclaimer when I when I hop on here. We're just going to dive right into it. Um, if you're new on here, um, a couple of things. If you're on your phone, I had a couple people write in. If you're on your phone, you can always swipe to the right, and then you won't see all of the comments coming up, and you'll just get to see this very full face because it's been full with lots of um, carbohydrates and sugar because guys I feel things and when I feel things sometimes I eat them so here we are um, and uh, so I was excited to share this all with you and if you oh oh yes uh, if you many of you had asked about the exchange I'm going to talk about that um, throughout the um, course of tonight but we're gonna do like a special for you guys because a bunch of you guys were asking about it so don't let me forget to talk to you about that but we're gonna give you guys um, a special code called stay home <laughs> apropos um, and be able to let you guys get that for discount I can't remember what the discount is I think it's 10% off. Maybe you could put in the comments, Juliana or Shara, what that discount is. But let's get started. Last week, if you had not had a chance to listen to last week, there is a reason why I am doing the way that I'm doing this series. So we are in a four week series on disruption because hello, we are being disrupted. We are in trauma. It doesn't matter how you look at it. Uh, it doesn't matter what you think about trauma. It doesn't matter if you think that we shouldn't have trauma if we're in Christ. The truth of the matter is our brains are responding to an epidemic pandemic that is taking over our lives and is shutting down the world. And we can't help but have a human response to that. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to not have um, a deity response to that, 
but to to not have a response in the ways of grieving and trauma and loss would mean that we were not human. That would mean that we are complete, um, pure beings, uh, and we would be God is, in essence. So if you did not get a chance to watch that, I really wanna encourage you to watch it because it will make this week make a little more sense, but even if you haven't watched it, this week will still make sense. So. I want to dive in and I want to talk about hope. If you have, hey, Heather, good to see you. If you have um, a, a journal or a notes, I'm going to be talking quite a bit. And um, so, so take some notes. And at the end of this, you'll be um, able to write down some questions and I'll do my best to answer them. So I want to dive in to the topic of hope. Now, here's my disclaimer. Um, I, I am working out hope. I do not have it all figured out. Um, I am um, really in a state of understanding it more than I ever have, but it has been a real reworking of what I thought hope was, how I approach hope, um, and really the difference between hope and faith, and really understanding that some of my upbringing in evangelical church, I was raised in an evangelical church, was kind of this idea that hope was optimism. Like, it's all going to work out. It's all going to be okay. And um, that's not necessarily true on earth, which, hi, aren't you glad you signed up to watch this? <laughs> um, but hope is different than faith. Faith is to remember um, what was, to remember what God did, to remember um, what has gone before us. Faith holds us to an understanding of, of who God is eternally um, and, and where he came from. So it's, faith is a lot of remembering our past so that we can then have hope. It's as if hope and faith are twins. They, they kind of work together. But hope is, is almost the memory of future, the memory of bringing what, what, what was and what said was uh, what will be into the future. So let me define that a little more. There's a guy named Gabriella Marcel. He's an existentialist. He's actually not a believer, but has incredible faith. And he says, um, well, what is hope? Hope is the memory of the future, and, which is kind of like I have to sit in that for a little bit to remember what God said in the past that will happen in the future. It's in essence what we pray when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Let your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, so we know that there's a heavenly realm. We know that that is coming. I've never been to heaven. I don't know what heaven will be like. I only can think of heaven in terms of beauty. Like it's going to be amazing. It's going to be beautiful. But, but it's not, hope is not optimism. It's not this sense that everything is going to work out. You know, when I speak to people um, and they are in terrible situations, uh, and, and I say something like, uh, their daughter has leukemia. And I say, it's all going to be okay. God's got a plan. Now, is that true? Does God have a plan? Yes, that is true. But that's not necessarily hope. It's actually dismissive. And it's a way of me keeping what hope is at bay. You see, hope is also not pessimism. So on the other side of optimism would be pessimism. And, and pessimism is this kind of place where we sit and we go, um, it, it's all futile, right? It's all just, it doesn't matter. It's all going to end. It's, it's, it's all futile. It's, it's not pessimism and it's not optimism. Hope comes in the place of understanding that death and pain are real, but resurrection is is available and so a lot of people would say well you know we can just hope that it's you know it's going to be good it's like wishful thinking it's all going to work out it's all going to be okay i mean look at the resurrection it all worked out for jesus yes but jesus still after his resurrected body remains in heaven with his scars he, he doesn't he, he isn't removed from the pain that he endured 
in his resurrected body, which I find this very fascinating because if we look at hope, now I know some of you are like, okay, Carrie, we're like, get to the good stuff. Just hang on. Cause I've, I've got to plant this foundation for you because so much of your calling, so much of what you believe about hope will actually begin to shift and there will be power in it rather than just a grabbing at straws, wishful thinking, hoping and optimism that it's all going to work out because I can't tell you that COVID-19 is going to work out. I don't know. I don't know. I know the ultimate future. Yes. I know that one day we'll be in heaven. Yes. But what does that mean today? How does the kingdom come? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he's definitely not saying pray a prayer of like one day we'll just be in heaven. And so close your eyes to the realities of today or just pretend it's not happening. That's not, that's not hope. That's a false sense of hope. In fact, it's actually in the sense of optimism pushes away hope because it doesn't allow you to go into the depths of pain. Hope rises out of pain. Nobody likes that. Everybody wants the silver lining. It's so much easier to cast a blind eye to the reality of what we're even sitting in as the world. Your body is holding an immense amount of trauma and grief and pain. I have a dear friend who was diagnosed with COVID-19. I don't know what the outcomes will be. I have a friend who lost their husband to COVID-19. The reality is whether we want to approach it in ambivalence, pretend it's not happening, or whether we want to fixate and feed the fear, the reality is we are sitting in unprecedented times. And how do we have hope in the midst of it? If we begin to say, it's all going to work out. It's all going to be fine. It's actually dismissive and unkind to the very real pain and places of your heart that actually want to grow hope. Hope does not grow without pain. Hope doesn't grow in the midst of la la land. Hope grows in the midst of pain. So how do we defiantly hold to the coming kingdom despite what we see today? How do we defiantly hold to the kingdom of God coming here to earth from, from, from up above, bringing the kingdom of God here to earth, despite what we see today? I went to, I had the opportunity on Monday, I think it was. Honestly, I don't even know what day it was. Lord Jesus, help us, right? What even day is it? I look forward to Thursdays. It was Monday. Monday, I was asked to go to a factory. I'm going to be honest, I have never been to a factory like this, never. And I showed up to the factory and there are many workers, many of them had English as their second language. Um, I had to have an interpreter um, and they asked me to come in. I could not say the name of Jesus, but you better believe I insinuated some things. Um, but I came in and I asked what this company does. Uh, for uh, like, what, why, what do they do with this company? And why are they deemed essential? The government has said they stay open, they're deemed essential. I found out that they make these little gaskets that help the pumps in the Purell bottles to work. They also create little gaskets that help the pumps in the hospitals to be able to push out hand sanitizer and other uh, cleaning products. Little gasket, that's what they make. That's what they make there, is these little tiny gaskets. And I began to think, wow, I wonder how many of these people have ever wondered on the face of their, the earth if they were essential. If they've ever even heard those words. They are riddled with anxiety. Many of them are leaving. The company is, has so much work to do. They're hiring <laughs> um, because people are leaving and they're worried that they're, they're going to shut their doors, not for lack of work, but for lack of people coming in. So they asked me to come in. And I started with, 
do you know what it means to be essential? Have you ever heard those words? Have you ever desired deep inside of you that one day you would grow up and you would do something that would change the world? That you would do something that with your hands or with your gifts, that it would make a mark? Who would have ever thought that a tiny gasket would be the very thing that deems you essential? Now, I was able to speak into more than that, that you are essential far beyond what you make on this earth, but who you are, what you were created, how you were created is essential to the planet. You see, hope begins to rise in the midst of adversity, in the midst of pain, in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of our broken stories. Something begins to rise up in you that says, hell no, not on my watch. I loved meeting with Dan Allender, one of my uh, professors up at the Allender School of Psychology and Theology, and I've been studying with him, and he was the one that introduced me to this idea of, Carrie, what is your hell no, not on my watch? For my staunch evangelicals, I know that word is a little hard for you, but it needs the moxie of that. Um, and I began to wonder, you know, I can't change culture. I can't, um, uh, oh, my notes on the mic. Okay, good. Thank you for telling me that, Rebecca. Um, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, I can't change culture. I can't, I can barely change a human heart. I, I don't, I can't actually even change a human heart. Like the Holy Spirit does all of that. But what I can do is something that only I can do. And that is uh, my unique calling and my unique gifts. But that hope, that, that calling that I have did not rise out of places of victory. It actually rose out of places of pain. That hope begins to rise at the place of pain where I say, I can't change the culture. I can't change uh, a, someone's heart. But can I begin to play? to begin to play on the earth, to begin to use my gifts in the form of play. That hope is the area that I begin to fight against what I see is wrong and say, hell no, not on my watch. You know, something about the, the machinery that I saw and the man that created the gaskets and the workers that were there, and they have no idea the ramifications of the fullness of what they're doing, but their gifts are being used in the most minute and small way that something inside somebody decided this would be a better way to create a gasket that would help a pump to use Purell, and they may not have ever have been thinking, oh, it's gonna really help when a, when a pandemic strikes. Of course not, we're, we're not always thinking that way, but something creative was birthed inside of them. You see, hope rises in all of us. It brings out our calling, and our calling is unique to our story. My calling to sit with you and to call out hope, to, to allow you to lament and to also hope at the same time is because of my unique story. The story of watching as my mom suffered with eating disorder and isolation from my own stories of feeling like a stranger in my own home. Like I didn't know how I fit and I was loved. I was loved. But my own um, narrative and the own trauma in my home made me see things that nobody really wanted to see. And so I felt like I didn't fit. So do you think that when I started a, a movement of freedom that it came just from victory? No, it came because something rose up in me. Hope began to rise in the midst of my pain and began to say, hell no, not on my watch. Not on my watch will I watch men and women suffer, that somehow they have to pretend that they're okay, that lament is not faith. No, not on my watch. Jeremiah 29, or, or no, I want to offer um, Psalms 27, 13. I'm going to read it to you. And it says this uh, in Psalms 27, 13. I am certain that I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. For I am certain, can you hear the hope in that? 
that I will see God's goodness in the land of the living. This is hope. This is moxie. You see, hope is defiant. Hope is active. Hope is something that you take and you, and you own because of what you know in heaven to be true, but you grab it out of the heavens and you bring it here on earth and it begins to manifest itself through your unique story and your unique calling. Hope is defiant. It looks at the evil of this world. It looks at the wrong of this world and it goes, I am certain that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. This is the power that we possess as we indwell the Holy Spirit and bring this to the land of the living. Hope holds dreams. Hope holds desire. And this is why hope is risky. This is why we would rather think optimistically than actually hope. Because hope means that we are going to have to grieve along with hoping, with defiance, with hell no. Because we know that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the evils and the rulers of this dark, dark world. We're seeing it as a pandemic, a sickness that is overtaking, and yet there's something in us that begins to speak out and say, what if? What if we did it this way? What if something that I could do, and I believe that God is calling this out of, out of so many of us, I referenced earlier Jeremiah 29, 11. It is such a popular verse. And um, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, to give you a future and a hope, right? We love that verse. We love that verse. When Jeremiah was writing this verse, he's writing it to people in exile in Babylon who are destitute, who haven't heard from God for a really long time. And Jeremiah has to take this prophetic stance to say, hope, God has a hope for you and a future for you. And he begins to speak this, but the reality is we, we wear that on t-shirts and walk around with it, but who it was being spoken to was in a very hopeless time. It was in a time where it was like, we don't even see this. We don't even feel this. We don't feel the outcome of this. They were sitting in trauma and grief and lament like nobody's business. And here comes Jeremiah speaking out prophetically the hope of heaven coming to earth. See, when we say, hell no, not on my watch, we are saying, hell no, but heaven, yes. Quote from Dan Allender, hell no, but heaven, yes. And how will I begin to bring heaven here on earth? How will I begin to partner with God to bring the goodness in the land of the living? Hope is not a feeling it's not passive, it's not wishful, it's not optimistic, it's not pessimistic. Hope is defiant. Hope comes from your calling. Hope comes from your story. Hope rises up in the midst of adversity and brings about heaven on earth. My job as a prophet is to call all of you to not bypass lament and rush to hope, but let you understand that when you marry grief and hope, this is when heaven comes. It's why Jesus kept his scars. It's why Jesus reminds us that he holds both death and resurrection. This is the beauty. So when, uh, when my stories of pain begin to rise up, and I start to have accusations, because I get them all the time. When I start to feel it in my body and I want to respond in survival ways, and my survival way is to isolate because I'm in trauma. I'm fragmented, I want to numb, I want to isolate. These are my goals. We either fight, like I said last week, or fight or, fight, or freeze. I begin to go, wait, God, how will your goodness be shown in the land of the living? And how do I want to partner in it? So my question to you is, where did you give up on hope? 
Usually those stories come from childhood places where we had imaginations and we dreamed of things, but our dreams were either dashed, they were ridiculed, mocked. Maybe we were hurt so badly that to dream again feels so risky. So where did you give up on hope? Where did you let dreams die? Where did the, the calling inside you that says, what if? What if I did it this way? What if I showed up with that writing? What if I packed my kids in the car and we just drove down the street and dropped baked goods off? What if I began to speak or sing or do art or take photos? I don't know. But what if, and it's unique to your story, you'll never hear me get up and say, I have a dream to be a runway model. <laughs> I have a dream to be a singer. That's not gonna happen. It's not unique to my story. I also will not, that's the doing, but the, the, the bigger is the hope of the hell no. The more the parts of my story, you, you won't actually see me really stand up and fight against homelessness. Do I think it's wrong? Totally. Will I partner with people to do that? Absolutely. But what's unique to my story is voices being stolen. Of, of lament and grief not being honored. That's the part of my story that is very real of what I witnessed in the brokenness and the trauma of my home. So you better believe that part of my what if, what if I got up and actually said what was really going on, would it change the trajectory of people's hearts? That's my what if that began to birth in me. Freedom movement is not what I do or who I am. Freedom movement is not my identity. Uh, being a Garcia is not my identity. My identity lies in the hope that I have found in the redemptive love of Jesus Christ, bringing heaven on earth into my story and now me giving it the output to the people around you. Don't let hope be killed by disappointment. Can I just let that sit there for just a minute? And then we'll go in. If you have some questions, now would be the time to start writing them. Don't let hope be killed by disappointment. I believe that the job of the enemy is to kill, steal, and destroy. We read that. But he actually doesn't want to take you out physically. He wants to kill desire. Because if you begin to dream again, if you begin to have desire, which I know is risky, I know it's risky. I feel it all the time. There's some dreams I'm working out right now that I am scared. I'm leaving in April to begin to write again. I have so much I want to write in the next book that I want to write, and I'm terrified to do it. I'm not great at it. It's a labor of love for me. Some of the stuff I want to say is probably not going to be received with the most open arms. And yet, it has been the very places that I have found what I have been longing for my whole life. Freedom to live fully alive, what has that meant? Don't let the disappointment of what has happened and how does hurt you, the demand that says, you better act this way, you better do it this way. If you are seeking first the kingdom of God, he will add all these things unto you. So where did hope begin to die? What part of your story did it begin to die? Can you remember the little one inside you that had dreams and hopes and visions, radical ones, big ones? That's why faith, hope, like a mustard seed, would move a mountain. Because you in your dreams, you in your hope, not your wishful thinking, but you in all of that would begin to change the world. So. That's just a little caveat of how I feel about hope, something that I'm gonna be offered. I'm not really allowed to say, but I can't help myself. But in a few weeks, I wanted you to hear it here first. Um, I'm gonna be opening up, uh, we're gonna do an interactive Zoom. And it's gonna be just, I mean, it says just, just for 100 people, but um, I, I'll let you know more of the details next week, but we're gonna dive more into this and we're going to be doing live coaching and we're going to like dive a little bit into this topic way more deeper into disruption, the freedom and disruption, and this is one of the topics. So um, I hope that you would join me. But I wanna hear from you. What is this stir up? Before you, I know some of you have already asked questions and I'll go through, there's literally a hundred and some comments on here. So um, I'll go through and 
um, look at some of these. But I want to leave you, I, I want you to sit in this thought. Two, two thoughts. One, where did you give up on hope? And what is whispering to you? And you don't have to answer this on here. This could be something like, this is your homework for the week till we meet next week when we talk about community and disruption. But where did you give up on hope? Your homework for the week. And if nobody was watching and you weren't worried about what anyone thought, and you really set down all of the fears and the worries that you were carrying from what has happened to you in the past where hope was so disappointing and hope was so risky and hope was so painful. When you dreamed and you hoped, it was dashed. What is the whisper of the what if? What if I did it this way? What if I began to make gaskets? You are essential to the kingdom of God. And the enemy's job is to kill that desire. The enemy's job has been your whole life to silence you in, in the places, the painful, broken places of your story. But what I know about hope is it's defiant. It's also so beautiful, we can barely take it in. It is the beauty of heaven on earth manifesting itself through the only way God in his miraculous love does through the brokenness of our story. He brings beauty. That's hope. That's hope. When we offer hope to the world that is lost and broken around us, it is not trite answers that say, it's going to all be okay. No, hope says, this is terrible what's happening. And somewhere within me, I am going to rise up. And what if I did it this way? So where do I find you today? Where do I find you today? And if you want to know more about your story, you kind of go, I love the hope, I love all this, but I've never really sat in my story. The exchange, the, the course that I wrote, it's eight videos, you can watch it. It's got a full, like full workbook course that goes with it. And it helps you dive into so much of your story and the places of grief and trust and where some of those issues might rise up, all of that. It also leans itself to victory. So this message, if this is prompting something in you and you go, man, I, I just, I want the hope and I understand what she's talking about, but, but I can't like, I, I feel like I'm making a jump if I go there. Be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself. I've done a lot of work and I am learning more and more every day how much I don't know. But if you need to redo that story or go through that story, stay home is the code. You can do that on wearefreedommovement.org. Oh no, yeah, we are free to move dog work. You can go on there and you stay home is the code and you get a discount off of the books. Um, I don't remember what it is, but it's, I know it's a good discount. I can't remember. Um, and I'll have one of the girls pin that at the top for you. Um, so how are you? Where are you? How do I find you? Let's see. Let's see, comes from our calling, like grief, hope, just got chills, so good, friend. Thank you, Jules. Okay. That's right. Okay, let's see. I don't even know how to dream as a child. It was squashed. Absolutely. And here's the thing, Emily, you aren't the only one. It's not that your parents or, you know, they they're fallen people. My parents are fallen people. I'm a fallen parent. I am definitely going to be um, involved in squashing my kids' dreams. I don't want to, but I can't help my, I mean, there's just part of me that's just human. But the enemy is the one that is really wanting to silence the goodness of what you carry. You see, it's very easy for me to convince you of all the things you've done wrong. That is not, that is not hard. Uh, to convince you of your goodness, all of you, uh, it's much harder. You will fight me tooth and nail about how not good you are. And I believe that God is wanting to rise up goodness out of you in the land of the living. So we have to go back to some of those origin stories, begin to see where it was being stolen and killed and destroyed desire. 
Do you have any advice for when you reach the point that you feel like you can't even bring good on earth, like you have nothing to offer because you feel defeated? Um, yes, Sarah, I would say we need to begin to examine, I think, that question that I want to offer you. A lot of people will say, why go back and look at the past? I can't change the past. Uh, uh, yeah, I know that you can't change the past, but we can redefine what the past now means. You see, the past means something for you. The, what you've been told, the narratives you've been told, the, the stuff that was untrue that now feels true, like you don't even know that it's not true. It's not enough just, you know, there's an identity thing going around, which I love, but it's like, hey, just don't believe the lies. Okay. I don't even know that they're lies. They feel true. So the reality is, is we have to go back to those stories that made us. The stories of our life. Yes, we are new in Christ. Yes, we have authority in Christ. Thank you, Jesus, we have authority in Christ. But how do we have authority over things in our lives if we don't actually examine where our stories come from, the ways the enemy has worked to tear us down, and the very innocence and goodness that was being robbed of us from our stories. You have to sit in the wholeness of who you are. You aren't an adult separate from your childhood. You are not that. You are the totality of your existence. This is true. And so you begin to go into those places of story. Pick one. Don't pick a hundred. Please love yourself. And no, you won't get the memory right. Exactly. You won't. It's, that's not the point. The point is going and examining the context of that, or the, the context of that story. What was being played out for you? What did you make it mean in the context of how you were raised? This is where you begin to start, Sarah. The exchange would be great for that. If you've already done that, I really recommend going through it a second time with this kind of newfound thought. Um, why am I frustrated by all the Christian positive attitude right now? Of course, we need to be positive to counter the discouraging news, but there is something in me that rebels because in my heart, I do not feel positive or grateful. What am I missing that other Christians seem to have right now? Oh, I love this question so much, Rebecca. My prayers are angry and upset and discouraged while others seems to be finding the silver lining. Oh my gosh, I think I could do a whole podcast on this. Or live on this. Um, there's so much I want to say. Uh, what I want to say is, first of all, uh, I know you, Rebecca, so you are, uh, you are acquainted with and comfortable with lament. Um, most people are not because lament means that they have to allow themselves to feel pain and it is easier to keep pain away. But remember, if we keep pain away, we keep hope away. Can you hear this, friends? If we keep pain at a distance, we cannot go to the depths of hope because hope is defiant. Hope sees the pain and wants to do something with it, okay? So you are acquainted with this. I would say understand that a lot of people in their own ability to engage right now, they are in steeped in trauma, and when we are in really severe trauma, it is very difficult for us to enter into grief if we haven't had the maturity to do so. We haven't had the training to do so or the understanding to do so. So hold them with the understanding that it, they're, they're, not, they're not ready. It's, it's too much. It's easier to go here. Also know that it is absolutely 100% a survival mechanism. To keep a stability lining is... Now, does this mean that we don't think like God's on the throne? But there's a real reality in our world right now. Absolutely a real reality. And denial of that, ambivalence to that is the flight response in trauma. So for you, Rebecca, I would say you are allowed to be angry. You are allowed to have, in fact, you actually can't grieve without anger. So you're welcome. David's posture. Where are you, God? Our, our message from last week that we dove into last week to hold the midst of despair and yet you are my refuge. There is something about that that the more we mature, and it takes an incredible amount of maturity to do this, to hold death and resurrection. I'm not, I'm not there. I'm getting there, <laughs> inching my way. But there's something in the maturity of being able to marry that that moves you into a place of Christ-like 
presence where he keeps the scars and yet he's in a resurrected body. It's just, it's, it's, it's so profound. So hold it, hold your prayer of I'm upset and I'm discouraged. I love though, in that sentence, you say, my prayers are angry and upset. You are praying. You are hungry. There is something rising up in you that's like, this is wrong. Maybe it's turned towards God right now, but eventually that same moxie that you have, that same hope that's being forged within the fire will begin to open your eyes and probably will begin to go, how can I hold space for people who want to actually move into a place of lament? How can I be there for them? Because the other stuff you're not interested in. This is where your calling is being risen, Rebecca. Your calling, as you are writing it, is being written. And we will all get to see the glory of it, the goodness of it. Um, I still struggle with unworthiness or feeling unworthy. Accusations. 100% number one accusation is unworthy. But... I'll move on. Not good enough to share. This is from Risha. Not good enough to share some of what I have learned. Not good enough to step into my calling. Not good enough to even do a job that I used to think I was good at. My struggle has come alive now because the busyness is gone. What would you say as words of advice to me and people like me? And sounds like the homework for the week would help me out a lot. There is accusations pinned against you from very early on. Ones that you didn't even know were happening. Agreements that you made that said, yes, I sign on the dotted line. I am unworthy. And I don't know what your, your story is. We all, none of us feel worthy. There's no one on here that feels worthy. And by the way, everybody on here feels like they're too much. Everybody. Everybody feels too much and everybody doesn't feel worthy. It's like the, num like the number two things that, that the enemy will use. But remember, the accusations and the agreements that you make will be very unique to your own story. So what do you feel unworthy about? It's not so much I don't do my job. It's that I'm going to be stupid when I talk. It's that um, my words aren't going to make sense. There's something about the ac accusation, the, ac the accuser, and the agreement that you've made with the accuser that says, yes this is true and i believe it and until that agreement is broken you will always live up to the contract you've signed always now that's a lot it's getting into spiritual warfare stuff and and you guys are all gonna click off if i start going there but it's true it's true dive into the story find a place risha deep in your story uh, ask God to reveal it to you to begin to see where did these agreements and these accusations begin? Who, who spoke something over you? What was said? What did you hear that was said and made it true for you? Because until you start seeing that, you'll just rework these accusations over and over again. And no matter how much therapy you do, no matter how much work you do, you will find yourself stuck. I hope that helps. That's a lot. That's a lot. Um, to, to put down there. Let's see here. Uh, I agree with that. Heaven on earth. Good. Um, highly recommend the workbook. Thank you. I have never intentionally sat in my story. It is too scary. So true. Here's the thing, Michelle. Um, you do sit in your story. And this is the truth for all of you. You do sit in your story. Your story is being played out every day. And honestly, I do I don't want to look at parts of my story. I didn't anyway. Um, now that I do, I am able to have authority over the darkest places of my story. I'm also able to have hope and see that my calling has been risen from my story. That what evil meant to harm me, God means for good. That's what that means. So to ignore it is, it's, you can't ignore it. You, you can't ignore your story. It's being played out in the way you love your friends, in the way you love yourself, in the way you love God, in the way you love your children. It's being played out. And what God wants to do, uh, you see, you can be free. I accepted Jesus. I'm going to heaven. I, I'm free in the sense I am no longer a captive to sin. But fully alive, free and fully alive, fully alive, that takes 
work. It takes work of being honest, of being present, of allowing hope to grow in the midst of pain, to face off shame that we want to run from and hide from, except, and except we cannot, we cannot grow, we cannot get to the places of trauma and hurt without engaging our shame. And so I encourage you, sweet Michelle, to be kind to yourself, that to engage your story is to begin to love the little girl that needed to be cared for, that needed to be tended to. It's the very places that God delights in, that he created you with all of your moxie and tenacity and just imagination. And as the enemy, as he does, who's just terrible, began to steal and kill and destroy, God is saying, with my hand, Let's walk into some of these places that feel like death. But if you let me, you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You don't need to fear, for I am with you. Fear doesn't mean we don't feel the sense of fear. Fear means that when we are walking with the Lord, we can feel fear, and yet we can move forward. It will not immobilize us. This is how we do parts of our story. Um, I have seen bits of the things of, I have dreamed as a child, and those times have been exclusively through using the trauma that took the hope as a way to hold space for people. It's amazing. And Victoria, we are watching that being played out in your life so much. Also, it's Victoria's birthday today. I just remembered that because I saw it on Facebook. Happy birthday, dear Victoria. We are so glad that you are alive, that you breathe breath and the glory of God shines upon you yet another year. Ah, oh, thank you for bringing the goodness that you bring into the land of the living. Um, oh, I was, I shared an encouraging text with someone while you were on here. She's on the verge of losing hope. I'm so glad. All right, let's see. Confession and surrender. That's a good chapter in my book. Okay, let's, I'm moving to see if there's any other questions. Any other questions? Let's see. I'm just really frustrated because I thought I was doing so well, but it feels like my past is slapping me in the face and pressing down on me. And I feel like that before this virus. Now the whole world seems to be going crazy too. So it's like it's being multiplied times a thousand. Feels like I can't hold it. And sis, sweet Sarah, you can't. You cannot hold all of that you're feeling. Remember, when you're trying to hold it all and it feels really big, there's parts of you that are betraying what your body is needing. So I would encourage you, Sarah, every day and several times throughout the day, this is what we talked about last week and I know you were on, several times throughout the day, do a body scan. What am I holding? What am I needing? What am I feeling? How can I invite God into that, even if the reality of that is what you would deem as ugly or not full of faith or whatever? To be kind and tender to the places of your heart in trauma. And to begin to understand that as we talk next week about community, there will be a place for me to address some of that. But you can't hold it all. Don't even try. Don't even try. Release and allow God. Uh, I, I, don't even, I want to take that back. Not release because that feels almost dismissive. But to be able to welcome God into the frustration and the anger. Go back and read Rebecca's question. I'm praying in anger and being upset. Can you be like Elijah? I am here, God, but I don't want to be. And watch as God ministers. He says, lay down and rest. You need some food. But we got to get out there or just take my life. No. Right now, you need to rest. See what God speaks. Growing up Baptist, and at least in my house, I... I was about what it looks like on the outside. I'm almost afraid to unleash my pain to get to the hope. I feel like I'm only allowed so much hope. I don't know why that makes me cry. <laughs> I think because I understand this a lot. I think um, because hope is risky. If we can just hope a little bit, then um, it won't kill us. Hope feels like it will kill us. Hope feels like if I get too much of it, if I want too much of it, I'm greedy. Or 
um, selfish or prideful. And it's just, it's just the farthest thing from Jesus. He is so good and he wants so much goodness for you. He wants so much hope for you to rise up within you, to dream again. It's not so much about unleashing the pain. The pain is there. It's there. It's allowing the hope to unleash in the midst of the pain, to risk again, to hope and know that, and I know no one's going to like this, but to hope and know that this world doesn't end well. There is no good ending. There is no, death is never good. Yes, we have resurrection and it's hopeful but to, and beautiful, but the garden was what it was supposed to be. And so no one ends well. No one dies well. It, it's tragic all the way around. And so that sounds depressing. <laughs> but it's to believe in bringing heaven here on earth while we're here. It's to not let dreams be shattered by futility and pessimism. It's to not, it's to not discount our heart with optimism. It's to, to dream for something better while you have breath in your lungs, Ms. Sheila. Uh, I can feel the weight. Can you guys feel the weight of that? Listen to your bodies. I can feel the weight of that as we sit in holding this tension, such tension. Let me see. I'm going to scroll down. We just have a few more uh, minutes, about 10 more minutes. Again, if you're on here and you're needing to step into more of this, I, I really mean it. Get the exchange. It's going to help you process some of this. And if you have the exchange with Sheila, I know you do. I would encourage you to go through it again. Don't pick all the things to grieve. Pick one. <laughs> um, and don't be scared of the exchange. That sounded scary. Sorry about that. I hesitate to tell my story because others in my family don't experience my family from the same perspective. I did it, and when I bring it up, they don't believe it. Yeah, some of that you have to be careful with because you can only tell your story. But um, I am learning that it is painful to sit in the realities of my story. And that I am not even getting it right. Like my memory is not accurate fully, but the context the, the, of what I made those memories mean was something to me and it affected me. Um, and so when I write, I'm able to talk more freely about my mom because she's no longer here. And I know that this was ultimately her desire. Um, but I tread lightly in some of the things of, of my home, but I am still able to share so much about my, my personal story and how I felt and what I made things mean, even if they didn't mean them to mean that. <laughs> Does that make sense? I'm able to share that. I think there is also, and I say this, Ari, please pray into this, but there is a point in which the scripture says there is a time that will be turning mother from a uh, child from father and and brother from brother and that i have had to learn that a lot of times my deepest relationships and my loyalties to my family were actually an idol in my life and i had to answer to god for the things that i said and what he's doing in my life and the truth about what i did and who i am and also the empathy i needed to give to myself because it was easy to go, they're great parents, it's not that big of a deal, let it go. And yet so much of my story um, was not okay. And I was deeply wounded. And, um, and God has done amazing, amazing things. But I think minimizing my story and minimizing my pain only did so much more harm. And freedom has come by not minimizing my story. Um, Let's see. I wish I could take my husband's encouragements the way I know he means it. My brain takes it as being disappointed with me or that I have failed him. How do I not allow myself to get automatically defensive? Um, this is story work. Katie, this is story work. Um, and maybe he is saying something that is making you feel defensive. But I would be curious around, rather than beating yourself up, or I'm so bad and he's so good, 
rather than beating yourself up, be curious around what parts of your story, especially those early on stories, did you feel like you had to always defend yourself? that you feel like you were often misunderstood or that you were a disappointment to people. I think you begin to allow yourself to kind of hold that and be able to, to, to rub that or, or um, highlight that through the grid of God's word and what God says about you and to begin to go, okay, what's true here and what's not true? What is, what is actually, what's he actually saying? And where have I heard this before? Have I felt this feeling before and outside of him? Have I held this before? And if I have, where's it coming from? Where, where are those beginning stories that have made me feel like that? And yes, what does God say about me? But even more like minute than that, like, where have I heard this before? Where has this happened before? And that will begin. So what I would say, don't beat yourself up. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you feel like the tone is you're bad, you're a disappointment, you are a failure, all of those are accusations. None of those are the voice of God. God's voice, yes, leads to conviction, but listen to the tone. It always has hope on it. It's loving and it's kind. So begin to listen to those places of accusation, begin to listen to those places of story and ask yourself, be more curious, why is it, and you're already starting because you're asking the question, why is it that I'm so automatically defensive? Where is that coming from? And don't approach it with, I'm so stupid. Approach it with kindness, tenderness, and curiosity. Um, let's see what we got. Hope is offensive to our hidden heart. Oof. I'm just going to leave that right there because that's good. Um, let's see. Let's see. Hope is born of suffering. This is why Christ came as a suffering servant. He will come again someday as a conquering hero. In the interim, we hope as he did. Beautiful, Rebecca. Beautiful. Looks like she wrote a blog on this and put a link up there. So that's awesome. Let's see if there's anything else while I still have you on here. Um, we just like one more question. Okay, good. I hopped on here a few minutes ago and have already spoke to me. God knew I needed to hear your heart and prayers tonight. Here's what I'll say in the very end um, of this, as I have some of you on here. One, if you need some resources, we have coaching and counseling that we're doing online. Um, we actually are, I kind of will announce this next week, but we're going to do some group work with no more than four people with some of our MFTs, um, that are amazing and are, um, trained in some of the same language, uh, and narratives that I, I talk. So it won't be like a far cry from what you're hearing uh, today. Um, also the exchange stay home is the code. If you want to get on there, I see that it's pinned here. Um, uh, on that. Um, and uh, lastly, I wore my shirt today that says, we will change the world. And I wore it because I'm not silver lining the reality of what we're sitting in. Please don't do it either. It actually will cause more harm to you. Go back and listen to last week's about engaging your body. You indwell the Holy Spirit. So your body holds, your body keeps a score. It just does. It holds the pain. It holds the trauma. If you don't engage the body, this hope work will not even make sense. It's just going to be really challenging if you don't engage your body and your story. So go back and listen to that. Share this right now. If you would be so kind, share this because people got nothing but time to sit on watch and they need a dose of the reality of what hope is. To recap, hope grows in the midst of pain. So many of you are going to be able to see stuff that angers you. Don't discount the anger. Don't think there's something wrong with you. Look at the anger and say, oh, just like Rebecca, something is rising up in me that says, I don't like this. It's not your attack on other Christians, Rebecca. It's the enemy. And it's the attack that says, I don't like that he's trying to take away the reality of what people are really holding and what's being offered, the, the goodness in the midst of the land of the living, where heaven would come here on earth. Remember, hope is defiant 
And it's so beautiful. Hope will rise up in you and say, hell no, not on my watch. Hell no, heaven yes. Thank you, Dan Allender, for that. I love you all. You're good. You're good. And you have good hearts. And you have good bodies. And you have good minds. And you have a good God who loves you and just, just adores you. In fact, if I could be so bold to say, you are his favorite. You are essential. You are essential to the kingdom of God. You are essential to God. And let's begin together as a community to start to break down some of these accusations and hurts that we hold that tell us that we aren't worthy of the goodness of God. Amen. I hope to see you next week. Community in disruption. We're going to dive into it. As always, I have a little bit of a different spin. I would love to see you. Please share this. It would mean a lot to me and the community around us. Be safe. Stay home. God bless you. Until we meet again, dear ones, in the name of God, we'll see you soon.